on the Corrie years. Coronation Street, sponsored by Harvey's The Furniture Store, bringing your home to life. Over the past 50 years, we've watched as Coronation Street has moved with the times, holding up a mirror to our ever-changing world. We need to be as truthful as possible, and it reflected the worries and concerns of the day. What's this doing in our parlour? Its story has been Britain's story. We felt we had to show what was going on, actually, with sort of teenagers out there. Over the next half hour, we'll see how events in the outside world played a part in creating some key moments in Weatherfield's history. This is a picket line. Very nice, yours isn't it? That's a factory, happens to be mine. It, it was amazing to think that we were actually attracting, well, certainly as much attention as the Royal Wedding. We'll hear from cast and crew who brought them to our screens. So you're an eco-warrior? Well, that's a polite name for us. The fact that Emily Bishop got involved showed that it was for everyone. I think that's where, you know, it did have some impact. And we're not budging. Yay! As we tell the stories behind the stories from five decades of the Curry years. It's 1981, and after defecting from the Labour Party, the Gang of Four form an alliance with David Steele's Liberals. Men and women of practical government experience who allied with us can present an alternative government to people at the next election. There's civil unrest as rioting explodes on the streets of Britain and the country is about to enter a new royal era as the monarchy, and one couple in particular, prepare to take centre stage. Meanwhile, back in Weatherfield, plans for another very public wedding are underway. Yeah, Ken, um, he'd had his problems with his women. Did. He was a lovable, caring person, and that's what Ken needed, really. And your intentions are honourable, of course. No. See you today, then. <laughs> He needed someone to just look after him and love him and to, someone to love in return. I think I love you, Mr Barlow. I know I love you. Mm. Oh, no, As Ken and Deirdre prepared to tie the knot, nearly 200 miles away in London, another ceremony was edging closer. It was very odd that Ken and Deirdre's wedding took place two days before Charles and Diana um, because it had been planned for months and so it was just by chance that it happened on the same week. That is definitely a girl's best friend, that is. It had better be. I can remember the build-up to the wedding and it was quite bizarre and it all kind of got mixed up together. <laughs> Do you know what? I thought you'd have got married the same day as Prince Charles because it's easy to remember, isn't it? Yes, but not so easy to organise, apparently. According to our vicar, the world and his wife want to get married on that day. It's just amazing to have two weddings. And we couldn't ignore it. Of course, newspapers jumped on it because, I mean, the nation was wrapped up in, you know, national wedding fever. A royal wedding, a television wedding. Diana was the nation's sweetheart, and Deirdre was television sweetheart. Britain prepared for the first of the two monumental weddings on the 27th of July, 1981, with Corrie's bride, making a sacrifice on her big day. It was the first time that Deirdre appeared without her glasses. He braced. All right. Walter, lead me to the altar. I had a really pretty blue dress, and I think we just decided that uh, it would be nice to have the hair and the dress and no glasses just for a change. He said, if Charlie and Di can have a glass coach, why can't Deirdre have a white limousine? <laughs> oh, into your pet. So I couldn't see a damn thing. And when the nation's favourite TV couple made it to the altar, there was a surprise in store for the lead actors. The actor, Frank Topping, who married Ken and Deirdre, was actually an ordained priest. So, in one sense, we're really married. <laughs> I pronounce them to be man and wife together. Less than 48 hours later, the world witnessed Prince Charles marry Lady Diana Spencer in London. But even that didn't overshadow the Barlow's big day. I bet you're both glad that's over. I enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, I couldn't stop shaking. Wedding at Candidri was viewed by more people on ITV than watched Charles and Diana get married. 
There were an awful lot of viewers for that episode, and it, it was amazing to think that we were actually attracting, um, well, certainly as much attention as the royal wedding. Three years earlier in 1978, and Kate Bush has topped the charts with Wuthering Heights. Britain makes a medical breakthrough as Louise Brown becomes the world's first test tube baby. As mum was wheeled into the operating theatre for the historic delivery, dad was watching pro-celebrity golf on the television. But over in Coronation Street, dramatic strike action is about to bring proceedings to a halt, both on and off screen. The Mike Baldwin character came in as a businessman and a bit hard-nosed, and he was a foreigner in, in many aspects, apart from coming from London. That's right, Jack, Mr. Baldwin. What are you supposed to be doing? Uh, unloading. Then look as if you're unloading! He had a different attitude to things. <laughs> the racket out there. Mike Baldwin opened his factory on Coronation Street in 1976, giving work to many of its residents, including cleaner Hilda Ogden. Oh, I always say you have to stick up for your rights in this world, not let yourself get trod on. The strike in 78 started with you know, poor Hilda saying, I want a new head for my broom. I'm told you've refused me my new cleaning equipment. That's right. Well, have you seen the state of this? Have you? She wanted a new brush, and he said, what's wrong with the one you've got? And she said, well, it's wearing out, and I want a new brush, and I'm a professional cleaner. You can have your cards, Mrs Ogden. Stupid I grow like this, I just don't need. You're giving me the sack. Got it in one. I was in a supermarket the next day. This woman hit me on the shoulder and said, she's a human being like us, you know. You've no need to have sacked her just because she cut the bristles off the bloody broom. But it's not fair, is that? No, it's not. Would, would, would you like me to have a word with him for you? Ivy Tilsley was a great character because she was militant, she was a socialist, she was a unionist. And so at the factory, she was just the bane of Mike Baldwin's life. Right. Well, I'm here to tell you, Mr Baldwin, I'm calling this entire factory out on strike. As of now. The factory girls' industrial action mirrored what was happening on the streets of Britain as the Labour government battled to control inflation. I don't like our men being out on strike at all. I want to be able to talk freely and responsibly with my employers. All through the 70s, you had three-day weeks, you had blackouts, you had strikes, and Coronation Street was reflecting what was going on in real life. This is a picket line. Very nice, yours, is it? That's a factory, happens to be mine. You're not allowed Desperate to there. keep the factory open, Mike Baldwin brought in non-union workers, or blacklegs, and violence ensued. I don't care what you call them, mate. They're ready to work. That's as far as I'm concerned, all I'm interested in. The strike ends up with this battleground on Croatia Street where the girls are sort of rioting and things. You're not scared of this lot, are you? You daft old women! And there's this wonderful moment, I think Annie Walker stood there going... I can't believe it's happening in this street. Wherever it's happening, it's always in somebody's street. Yeah. Ironically, just one year later, strike action really did come to Coronation Street. And this time, it was more than just the factory workers involved. It was the cast and crew. The big effect of the ITV strike in 1979 was that Corrie Street was off air for quite a few months. The Corrie faithful were not happy. I like Coronation Street and Crossroads and BBC just as rubbish. They're all is what day TV. I never missed it, and I do miss it now. Nearly three months of strike action later, in October 1979, the cast finally got the call to return to the cobbles. And what have they really been doing all the while? I'm afraid it probably sounds rather boring. I had decorators in and things like that, getting my home sort of together. I remember moving house around that time. And uh, apart from writing a story for the TV Times, doing a lot of um, a gardening. And they'll be pulling the pints again down at the Rover's Return at 7.30 tonight. And that's music to the ears of millions. Coming next on the Corrie years, teen drug culture takes its toll on Tracy Barlow. One night, and now you're telling me I'm going to be punished for the rest of my life. And Weatherfield gets an unlikely eco-crusader. Stop that! This minute! This is Bishop!
Coronation Street, sponsored by Harvey's The Furniture Store, bringing your home to life. Wow, you look radiant. That'll be the effects of new Comfort Brights. With its unique Pro White Illumina technology that helps make our whites whiter and Pro Bright Color Lock Formula, which helps stop colors fading. <laughs> Bravo! New Comfort Brights helps keep your clothes brighter, because us clothes are worth it. Over the last year, 450,000 Britons suddenly just upped sticks and decided to move somewhere new. LV. And they all probably moved for the same reason. The price, right? Fact is, most of our drivers pay £350 or less for their car insurance. Around a 1,000 people a day are joining LV. Join them and you could enjoy cheaper car insurance too. Call 0800 127 127 or go to lv.com. I will always be too young to be grey. Excellence Creme from L'Oreal, our only colour that helps to triple protect before, during and after. I take risks, but not with my hair. Rich colour, no greys. Excellence by L'Oreal Paris. Because we're worth it. We're worth it. We're worth it. Diarrhea can leave your body feeling out of tune. Only Imodium instants disperse instantly on your tongue and can stop diarrhea within one hour, gently restoring your body's harmony. Imodium Instants. Fast, but gentle. At Morrison's, brand new Heinz Squeeze and Stir. Just add water for a cup of soup that's thick and tasty. New Heinz Squeeze and Stir at Morrison's. You, Al, need a cup of the fresh one. It's one of the new ones from PG Tips. Oh, yeah, it tastes really, um... I saw this coming, which is why we're out here in the fresh outdoors with the fresh air, because the tea tastes... Eagle! How can a tea taste eagle? <laughs> Introducing the fresh one from PG Tips! Get the flags out and celebrate some fantastic offers at Barker and Stonehouse this summer. Like the rustic three-piece Villiers home office from our value range at only 995. Enjoy some fantastic offers at Barker and Stonehouse this summer. Now on. Is your house a Barker and Stonehouse? You know, it's great having hundreds of channels, but scrolling through them all to find what you want is, well, you know. On the other hand, with Virgin Media's TiVo box, you can search for your favourite show, actor or director and find loads of stuff they've done in seconds. Easy. We think it's the best way to watch TV ever. But what do you think? See you online. 99% of our customers agree that we're value for money. Find out why at thecarpeople.co.uk. The hassle-free way to buy a car. For the first time ever in York, it's Legally Blonde, the feel-good musical comedy and winner of the 2011 Olivier Award for the Best New Musical. Grab your friends and make a date with Ellen Bruiser from the 9th till the 20th of August. Ronnie Corbett's a national treasure, yeah. Ronnie Corbett is going on a personal journey <laughs> in the company of some familiar faces <laughs> to explore the origins of some of Britain's best-loved comedians. And I had him a resignation. <laughs> Ronnie Corbett's Comedy Britain, Saturday at 9, ITV1 and ITV1 HD. <laughs> Coronation Street, sponsored by Harvey's The Furniture Store, bringing your home to life. It's 1960, and Lady Chatterley's lover is getting the middle classes chattering. Why do you want a coffee? Well, we've heard so much about it, I just want to have a look and see what it's like. Britain's most privileged family welcomes a new member, Prince Andrew. Meanwhile, in the north, it's father against son, with a clash of generations at number three, Coronation Street. Ah, oh, sauce, can you? No, uh, no, thank you. Oh, but I got it specially. You always loved it when you was little. Oh, did I? The great thing about the Barlows was that they were very, very typical of the time. What's up? Nothing. But that's new to your expression for, then. Well, what's new to Frank had served in the war. He'd come back to children 
that he he'd never really met because they were they were conceived when he was on leave or before the before the war. So Kenneth had never had a good relationship with his father because he didn't know him when he was growing up. I mean, what I'm saying, don't you come correct him? Look, I'm not asking you for any money. Uh, he's a university graduate, and you could not impose an intellectual into a little back street like Coronation Street. So he had to be homegrown, as it were. So uh, he grew up in the street, and then he managed to get to university and get a degree. His family were very, very working class and very proud of him. But at the same time, his father was quite hostile to the fact that Kenneth had gone off, had this education, come back, and was then seen to be critical of their lifestyle and of the community. Well, he said that yesterday, and then again tonight. Why do we have to have cups of tea with our food? Well, I'll tell you for why. I like my food swilled down properly, that's why. <laughs> you better watch out, Ida. You'll be having to change into evening gown to eat your meals next. His father didn't enjoy that at all. Uh, he just wanted a good old working class lad who'd get a job and earn a bit of money. So David was his favourite. Oh, well, I'll go and have a look at this bike of yours. Oh, it's all right, Dad. I'll see to it. Well, where's your puncture outfit? It's in my saddlebag, but I told you I'll see to it. Right. Frank saw David as a lad like him. And he saw Ken as being something surprising and that he was uneasy in Ken's company, just as uneasy as Ken was in his company. Something else I don't forget, too, something you once told me. That if no son were cleverer than his father, we'd still be writing on cave walls. Well, if I were you, I'd accept that, because you can't have it both ways. Ken Barlow was a typical product of the 1960s student movement, a revolution growing in confidence on the streets of Britain. They said it was the big revolution of the 60s, both in clothes, sexual freedom, all sorts of things were going on, and uh, Ken was part of that. But there were a lot of people like Ken, the young students, first time wanting to express themselves, realising that they had a voice and they had some power as well, and they used it. And it wasn't just the class divide on Ken Barlow's mind. Like thousands of other young people, he was concerned with potentially far more explosive subjects. And what chance do you think any of us have got to make in old bones? I don't follow you, love. What do you mean? The bomb, Grandma, the bomb. Oh, don't talk about it. It doesn't bear thinking about. Well, somebody's got to talk about it. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not a documentary, it's a drama. However, uh, we need to be as truthful as possible, and it reflected the worries and concerns of the day. We're marching in a torchlight procession tomorrow night. With guitars. You might be. Ah, oh, Ken certainly isn't. The band, the bomb oh, march, was something that happened every year. And, um... Ken went on one, and uh, David's alter ego, Alan, went on two. I marched from Aldermaston to London, and I marched again from London to Aldermaston. So, um, yeah, it was a big issue. Oh, well, if you must go, at least have the sense to wrap up well. Here. Oh, a lot of people were really frightened of it and didn't quite know what it was going to mean. So Ken doing that was very much representing a feeling of the time. Fast forward 35 years to 1995, and celebrations to mark the 50th anniversary of VE Day. It had been a day of celebration and reflection, spectacular to the eye and for thousands to the heart as well. Britain's drug crisis worsens, thanks to the huge rise in the use of ecstasy. They can be bought for as little as 10 pounds, but no one can be sure what's really in them. It's a crisis which reaches Coronation Street as Tracy's wild child days take a serious turn for the worse. The um, Barlow household was obviously a very important household to us, and we felt it was quite natural that if you'd had um, domestic issues between Ken and Deirdre over the years, this was bound to impact on the teenage daughter. A divorce? Well, how do you think I feel coming from a broken home? I don't think that's very clever. Tracy? I think it was only as the character went on that she became quite sort of feisty and argumentative as well and stubborn. I hate you, you rotten cowie tart! Bill and me, I think it was quite odd when suddenly our little girl turned into this teenager who was taking drugs and drinking and, and it was... Uh, I think we found it quite hard to cope with in a funny sort of way. I'll not have your swigging lager under my roof. Come on, Debbie. Wait a minute. Viewers had seen Tracy Barlow grow into a rebellious teenager as her behaviour span increasingly out of control. 
but by 1995, things were going to get even darker. Being realistic, in the, in the early 90s, in Manchester, there, there was a lot of drugs being taken. Um, you know, it was the heart of music and um, clubbing and ecstasy. And so it was only really right that Crown Street reflect that. Millions of Britain's youngsters are now taking ecstasy, and not just at rave parties like this. I was called into Granada to be told about a storyline in which Tracy was going to take the drug ecstasy. It was quite tricky for the street because we weren't terribly good at doing that kind of thing. It felt much more natural on shows like EastEnders to go there rather than us. We, were, we tend to have a bit more heart and a, and a bit less issue, a bit, a bit less grit. But we felt we had to show what was going on, actually, with sort of teenagers out there. Uh, sister? Sister? Look, I know her. I know her really well. She used to live on our street. You know her name? Well, yeah. Tracy Barlow. Why? What's wrong with her? Sounds like bad ecstasy. Two girls just brought her in, dumped her and went. Ecstasy? I did actually find that quite challenging because it was something sort of worlds apart from anything I'd ever experienced. Was it the first time you'd tried it, or was it something you were in the habit of, well, you know, doing regularly? Neither. What does that mean? It wasn't the first time, no. But that's not the same as saying it was a regular thing. You don't want to be too tame. You want to be realistic. At the same time, you want to show that some of these actions have implications. We've been talking to the doctor. There's something wrong with your kidneys. And the damage is a little worse than they originally thought. They, they can fix it, though. They don't work properly. They need help. It's called dialysis. I think the praise probably came later when people sort of said, oh, yeah, actually, the, this is a very good way of kind of getting that across. Why me, Bob? Why me? Oh, no. <laughs> It's 1998, and Jerry Halliwell auctions off her wardrobe following her departure from the Spice Girls. The controversial Newbury Bypass finally opens after three years of unrelenting protests. We've lost this battle, but we're winning the war. And Weatherfield prepares to go green in the battle to save the Red Wreck. Yes? Geoffrey. Geoffrey Nugent Sorry. arrived on Coronation Street in late 1997 as the long-lost nephew of Emily Bishop. Edgar's boy. Hard to believe. In the character of Spider, what we were very keen to do was that he was like nobody else in Coronation Street. His character is kind of based on that whole movement of the time where you had a lot of young people who were basically taking direct action. The first thing they do if they want you out of an area is cut the water off or pollute it. So you're an eco-warrior? Well, that's a polite name for us. Spider reflected the rise of the environmental warriors determined to protect the country's green belt in the 1990s. What do you mean? He was meant to be swampy. Why did I stop digging? Um, because I felt that we'd made our point. The fun was that if you put him next to em Emily, they would just look chalk and cheese. You should try soya milk, aren't you, Em? I'm not a vegan, Geoffrey. One of the things I really liked about the relationship between Spider and Emily was the intergenerational thing. It's a nephew and his auntie, and they get on well. Did I show you the letter I've written? She was a woman of principles and strong beliefs, and she would probably respond quite well to some of the things he was talking about when it came to the environment. And I thought, if we all signed... You two have got a nasty shot coming, you know that? With Weatherfield's famous red wreck under the threat of redevelopment, it was time for direct action. I'm going up the Red Wreck now, way up the terrain. Work out where we're going to build the barricades. I mean, saying he's a vegetarian, it doesn't seem to have made him anemic at all. We were never sort of saying, um, oh, here's an issue and let's take it and run with it. As it was much more about um, the characters. Oh, Emily. Don't chain yourself to Alf Roberts, no matter how much you're tempted. Oh, oh, it's a thief. The fact that Emily Bishop got involved showed that it was for everyone. I think that's where, you know, it did have some impact. Stop that! This minute! Miss Bishop! 
And that's more down to Emily's character embracing it than it is Spider. Shirley, take this one here. Shirley, one off. I'm the As events became heated at the protest camp, Emily Bishop took matters into her own hands. I'm not dressed to stay out all night long, am I? Oh, for heaven's sake, Roy, give me a hand. Mrs Bishop, <laughs> no, no, you can't be serious. Whoever it was around the table said it would be very funny to see her up a tree and we all grinned and thought, got to do it. Just watch me. Yay! Eileen Derbyshire, the actress, Wonder Woman, was 30 foot up a tree with no safety harness. Yeah! No pass around. She does all her own stunts. Still there, then? I'm afraid so. When Emily's protest made the front page of the Gazette, her campaigning work was done. Oh, there you go, Auntie Emily. Best publicity we've had yet. It did reflect a sort of greater sort of social awareness that was going on at the time and that very unlikely people could make common cause. If we did our little bit for environmentalism, then good. We'll fight them in the beaches, we'll fight them in the oaks, we'll fight them underground, but we will never surrender. <laughs> No lighty, no likey. It's a simple rule, but it works. Over on ITV2 now, Paddy McGuinness pits 30 single girls against one single guy. Good luck to them. All asking, take me out. Here on ITV1, a tense competition winds up with a murder for Lewis to deal with. The Furniture Store, bringing your home to life. I think 